Hello, my name is Christine Stevenson, and my title at the Courthold is Professor of Early Modern Art and Architecture. A lot of my teachings about 17th and 18th century buildings in Britain, Christopher Wren, and so on, but I've also taught a course, um, a BA course about monuments, which lets me escape into the 20th and 21st centuries. And monuments are the subject of my taster lecture today, and specifically the idea of the counter monument. And I'll talk about two counter monuments today. Um, this is a war memorial in what's now Greater Manchester. Incidentally, I'll use the words monument and memorial kind of interchangeably, um, though the words can carry different connotations. The memorial was set up in 1921 to commemorate the 127 soldiers from two parishes, Heaton Chapel and Heaton Moor, who died during the First World War. Another 76 names with Second World War deaths were later recorded on an additional plaque on the base here. The entire structure uh, includes the statue of the soldier, the base with its bronze plaques with the names and this curved retaining wall behind. The original plaque explains that the monuments in memory of the men of Heaton Chapel and Heaton Moor who gave their lives in the Great War 1914-1919. Their name liveth forever. The last parts from a Bible verse and it's appropriate recording the names in bronze, which is what the plaques are made of, um, recording the names in bronze, a metal alloy that since antiquity has connoted permanence or immortality is part of the promise extended by the monument. We won't forget these men's names. And the statue um, by the Manchester sculptor, John Cassidy is also in bronze and it carries the same associations. The statue isn't supposed to be of a particular person. The soldier is a kind of every man to whom every grieving family could find, with whom every grieving family could find some comfort. Because it's such memorials, uh, we should keep in mind, are a, in a way a kind of substitute for grave sites. The vast majority of the British soldiers who died between 1914 and 1918 are buried overseas. And it wouldn't have been easy or affordable for a lot of people in Heaton to visit the cemeteries, or at least not regularly. Wherever you live in the UK or wherever you live in the world, I'll bet there's a war memorial of some kind or another not far from you. And I hope I'm not being unfair if I say that you probably haven't looked at it very closely, or at least not recently. Most of the time, most public monuments are just part of the scenery, maybe coming to our attention only when there's a ceremony at them, like laying wreaths of poppies on Armistice Day every November. The idea of the inconspicuous monument is true, of course, except when monuments aren't being ignored. The drowning of this statue made headlines around the world. It's an earlier work, uh, by the same sculptor, John Cassidy. This late 19th century statue of Edward Colston had been controversial in Bristol for years before it was taken down, and it had seen lots of interventions, including the woolen ball and shackles attached to it in May 2018, in a kind of counter narrative to the monument's message, which I'll get onto in a minute. You've maybe already seen my colleague Tony Eastman's lecture about art and its destruction in this series. Tony also uses Edward Colston's monument as an example of a work of art under attack because of its associations with a repugnant historical phenomenon, in this case, the commercial trade in human beings. Colston was a philanthropist who, however, made a lot of money um, in the early British slave trade. The bigger point that Tony's making in his lecture is about the power of images and specifically in the context of Christian worship. 
in England and Scotland and the Netherlands and other countries in Northern Europe in the 16th and 17th centuries, religious images, statues of the Virgin Mary, for example, were a big problem for people who saw them as encouraging a false kind of worship. And a lot of them were destroyed. At the time, those wishing to save the paintings and sculptures said this, in effect, okay, you claim that these religious images are evil. We don't agree, but never mind. We can both agree that they're works of art that are part of our heritage, so we must keep them safe. And that's how the idea of an artistic heritage was born in these countries as a defense against iconoclasm. The supposed danger that these objects presented was neutralized by moving them to secular settings. Pieces of, of church stained glass, for example, found their way into private homes, now to be treated as historical art objects, not aids to worship. In a comparable kind of way, the Colston statues is now an M shed in Bristol, a public museum. And I'm recording this in July, 2021. So keep an eye on the statue's future. Again, a new kind of display. In this case, a very modern, slightly antiseptic looking gallery space neutralizes a formerly very disruptive object. Colston looks like he's floating uh, in this photo, but that's just a trick of the light. You can see that he's actually resting on wooden blocks. Another way of neutralizing the object is to invite a debate about its future. M Shed has an online forum where you can write what you think should happen to the statue. I'm not sure if the forums, the source of the quotations being projected uh, above the statue in which you can see in this photo. The words that are just coming into view or fading here, you can't read, but they say, it's all about making places, that is public spaces that we can all celebrate the implication being without uh, such reminders of this terrible injustice, slavery. But the idea is that everyone feels welcome to have their say here. I feel like I can't move these days without getting jumped on by the woke brigade, one person said. And it looks like the statue itself is talking, which is funny. I want to make two more points about the Colston Monument. And the first one is that it was put up 170 years after Colston died. An inscription on the base, which still sits in place, says that it was erected by citizens of Bristol as a memorial of one of the most virtuous and wise sons of their city, AD 1895, 1895 being when it was erected. Virtuous and wise may be stretching it. Never mind the slave trading, even by the standards of his day, Colston seems to have been a pretty bigoted character. And there was a lot of debate in Bristol about the wording of a supplementary inscription um, to say more about how he made his money before that project was overtaken by events by the statue's um, downfall. But I'm interested in the citizens of Bristol part. It's pretty sweeping. And it would have been more accurate to have said something like, arrest, erected at the instigation of one James Arrowsmith, who managed to get some money for the statue from local charities that had originally been funded by Colston's wealth and from a few members of the public, but mostly from an anonymous donor because public fundraising didn't come up with enough money. But that's rather inelegant and it would have been hard to fit it all onto the base. So let me put a proposition to you. The statue is obviously a monument to Colston, but it's also the material trace of negotiations that took place among the great and the good of Bristol in the early 1890s. Negotiations about the appropriateness of such a monument and about where it could be put. And untangling those negotiations would be part of our job as art historians. Certainly we're interested in artistic careers. Who was this Manchester sculptor, John Cassidy, born in Ireland, 
who achieved modest success, but never great fame or fortune? And how did he get picked for the job? And were it interested in excellence as art historians? The Colston statue is pretty good, I think. I especially like the dolphins around the base, which Cassidy's deliberately shown as a sculptor in um, Colston's own day would have shown them, not as dolphins really look. That is, Cassidy knew, of course, that dolphins don't have scales and long skinny tails, but he obviously looked at the way that dolphins had been carved almost 200 years earlier. But as art historians, we're also interested in money and politics and claims for authority over public space. Who thought this worth paying for 170 years after Colston died and why? And I mention this just because a lot of uh, the academic research that's conducted on monuments isn't done by art historians, but rather by sociologists and anthropologists and by uh, cultural geographers. And they do a good job and they've taught me a lot, but in the end, we're talking about an object, its creation and its life and time. And that's where art historians are experts. We're also in a position to assess the way that monument design is both impacted by and in turn impacts broader developments within the history of art. The second point I want to make is actually about the replacement for the statue, which briefly stood on the same pedestal. Bristol City Council took this down after a day. After the Colston statue was dragged away, a woman called Jen Reed stood on top of the now empty plinth or base, giving the raised arm clenched fist salute associated with the Black Power movement. And Reed's husband took a picture of her, which the sculptor Mark Quinn saw on Instagram and Quinn immediately got in touch with Reed. And he made a 3D scan of Reed in the pose and then using 3D printing made a cast of her figure in black resin. And that's what was put up. It was, the erection was unauthorized, you know, um, and that's why it was almost instantly taken down. Quinn's always insisted that Reed should be credited as the co-creator of the statue, but that didn't save the piece from criticism. Some art journalists suspected the sculptor who's white was taking the opportunity to do some virtue signaling. Others pointed out that there are black sculptors around who could have brought more lived experience in any of their responses to the Colston statue. But my point is that we could consider the statue of Jen Reed as an answer or a counter to Colston's statue and not just in terms of its subject matter. Now, if this were a seminar class with 10 or 12 of you sitting around a table, the way I usually teach monuments, at this point, I'd ask you to compare the two statues in terms of their materials and manufacture and what the differences might mean. The Colston statue is bronze, as I mentioned, a material that carries associations of permanence or immortality. A bronze statue also takes a lot of time and care to make. Reed's statue, which was ready five weeks, just five weeks after the Colston statue was pulled down, wasn't intended Quinn said, to stand forever. And the technique used, the 3D scan and the printing, for me also connotes something more like photography than sculpture, if you see what I mean. It's as if the work is made by digitization and not by human hands. So we might speculate that the Reed statue called a surge of power is therefore public sculpture presented as a near instant and authentic historical record, as opposed to some idealized uh, or euphemistic version of the past. I'm not saying that's what I think Surge of Power statue is, rather that I'd want to chase some of these ideas with you. So this is my first counter monument, the monument that simply replaces another one, 
the counter monument that works in time. My second example in Hamburg in northern Germany doesn't replace what it counters, but sits very close to it. It works in space, that is. And to explain this, I have to describe this monument, another war memorial. The National Socialists, the Nazis, seized power in Germany in 1933. And after that, Hamburg, which is, was and is a city-state, lost a lot of its independent authority. What had been a left of center city-state saw the construction of a monument that would have been impossible there even a few years earlier in terms of its uncompromising message and intimidating form. Denkmal is one of the German words for monument. It literally means a mark to think. And this one was dedicated to the 76th Inf Infantry Regiment of the German Army, which was normally based in Hamburg. You may be, well, probably not. I was going to say you could maybe just make out the inscription, which is done in the old fashioned Fraktur type of lettering. Deutschland muss leben, it says, und wenn wir sterben müssen. Germany must live, even if we have to die. Quite a different message from the little war memorial in Heaton with which I began. The photo's in focus, but the monument looks as if it isn't. That's partly because of the way that the horizontal courses here between the blocks of limestone are showing, and partly because of the way that the sculpture has um, soldiers marching in rows of four with the rifles on their shoulders. It's as if you're looking not at four soldiers, but at a single one with a long exposure so that the same pairs of legs appear in different positions. It's interesting too, to consider the monument as if it were architecture, not sculpture. For me, it evokes the severe classicism of something like the Brandenburg Gate, one of Berlin's most famous landmarks, which was designed by the architect Karl Langhans at the end of the 18th century. And I'm specifically thinking of the way that these blocks of stone here underneath this projecting element remind me of those, the blocks of stone sitting underneath the projecting um, moldings or elements on the gate. And at this point, if this were a seminar class, I'd ask you if you thought I was getting a bit carried away with the comparison and you'd maybe say, mm, maybe, or else, no, I get the resemblance. And this kind of architecture uh, was very much admired by the National Socialists. You can see the soldiers marching round and round this massive impenetrable block more easily in this photo because the sun shining. The British Occupation Army in Hamburg tried to blow up the 76er monument immediately after the Second World War. But after negotiations, the Hamburg authority in charge of monuments was able to prevent this. There was talk of taking off the inscriptions and the sculptures, but that didn't come to anything either. But there were plenty of illegal interventions well into the 21st century. Graffiti, small explosions, paint bags thrown at it, people chipping away at the marching soldiers. Um, the intervention shown on the photo on the right was, however, authorized. This anonymized figure in the banner is walking away from war. It's a brilliant since very simple response to the monument's message. It's a counter narrative in a way expressed visually, a bit like the knitted ball and chain on the Colston statue in Bristol. And um, it was staged by a group shown here who were trying to get um, erected a monument commemorating the bravery of, of the men who deserted 
the Nazi military during World War II, most of whom were summarily executed. And that monument has in fact uh, been created. But the counter monument that I'm talking about is here in the photo on the left. In 1982, the Hamburg Cultural Office decided that the thing to do with the problem of the Nazi monument was to counter it with something that would sit nearby and contradict its message about the glory of death in wartime. A competition was opened and it got 107 entries in response to the brief to redesign the site in such a way that a glorification of war becomes a memorial against war. And it was the prominent um, Austrian painter and sculptor and pr printmaker, Alfred Hertlitschka, who was commissioned to design a monument explicitly if it identified as a Gegendenkmal, a counter monument. Now, again, if this were a seminar class, I'd ask you, Based on these two photos, how did Herdlitschka counter the 76 Memorial, formally speaking? That is, how do they compare in appearance as opposed to subject matter? Now that kind of question doesn't ask for any knowledge on your part. You work with what you see. And with these sorts of visual analyses, it's always best to begin with the obvious. <coughs> Excuse me. The photo on the right isn't very good. I wanted one that clearly showed the two monuments together. But starting with the obvious, the 76 monument is a solid block with a surrounding relief sculpture. Herdlitschka's counter monument is a work in different parts, fragments really, and evidently in different kinds of materials. I'd also ask you to imagine what you think the difference would be for someone visiting the two monuments, what, it, what the, it would be like for you as a viewer. It's evident, I think, that while we can take the first monument in at a glance, that wouldn't work for the counter monument, which requires some walking around, some physical effort on your part. And here are newer photos of the counter monument. Only two parts um, of what was intended to be a four part monument were made. The other two sections were, um, were to have been called soldier death and fascism and the female image. And I would have been interested to see the last one in particular. What was made is the broken bronze wall. You can see uh, what's really the back of it here and part of the front of it here. And it's interesting that the bronze is broken, is shown fragmented. This is really using the um, material against its symbolic connotations. And there's a figure of a dead person in front. And this part of the monument memorializes those who died in the Hamburg firestorm, so-called, the result of a week or so, of very heavy allied bombing in the summer of 1943. Beside it in stone, here you can so, sort of see the side with the figures and here the, the reverse side, um, which is even more abstract. Uh, the stone part, um, represent, uh, stone part represents the sinking of a prison ship, the SS Cap and Kona, only a few days before the end of the war in Europe, military intelligence failed and British bomber pilots didn't know that the Cap Ancona was carrying concentration camp inmates. And here's a slightly wider shot of the counter monument. Significantly, its two parts are about civilian deaths in war, not the deaths of the supposedly uh, happily self-sacrificing soldiers on the monument to the 76th Infantry Regiment. I said that this counter monument requires some physical effort on our part. It also requires some knowledge. The, the plaque 
nearby here explains very neutrally and very succinctly the history of the monument and the counter monument. It also explains that had the counter monument been completed with its four parts, its footprint, that is its shape on the ground, would have taken the form of a broken swastika. But I don't think that would have been readily apparent to us as visitors as we were walking around the different parts. We would have needed the plaque to explain the bit about the broken swastika, just as, it, as the plaque explains um, just as we would have needed something like that to explain what the two parts of the monument represent. Now, whether that's a desirable thing or not is a good question. Do we want to have to decode monuments with the help of some kind of guide? And that said too, Herdlitschka's kind of symbolism and expressionism is no longer much in favor with artists trying to grapple with the horrors of the Second World War, including the Holocaust. I'll stop sharing now. That said, the concept of the counter monument of which Hamburg's was the first has been enormously powerful since the 1980s, as people in countries all over the world have re-examined painful parts of their histories They've erected monuments that <clears throat> they've erected monuments or counter monuments that they hope show their commitment to countering the old idealized and often false narratives. And I think that's tremendously interesting how we continue to place enormous trust in the promises made by monuments. Thanks. <laughs>